Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. What happens in Vegas goes all over the world on Black Entrepreneur Experience, episode 133. Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black Entrepreneur Experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Patrick Brontang II is one of two co-founders of the beauty brand Ceylon, a skin line specifically for men of color. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience. And I have given our audience a very brief bio. Why don't you fill in the gaps and share with us what you'd like us to know about you and your company? Sure. I'm the CEO and founder of Anim Labs. We are a company dedicated to developing personal care products for people of color worldwide. In 2017, I was working as a diplomat in China, and the stress of the job combined with the air and water pollution caused my skin to break out. I personally tried over 200 different products, but was shocked to find that nothing really worked well. And as a person of color, there weren't any solutions specifically developed for my skin. I eventually sat down with the world's leading dermatologist for skin of color, Dr. Lynn McKinley Grant who wrote the seminal textbook on the subject, it's called Visual DX, and learned that there weren't any personal, basic personal care products for people of color, things like facial wash, moisturizer. None of these products had actually been developed with people of color at the center of the development process. What, we don't, what a lot of people don't know is that 5% of any clinical trial population, any tested product, 5% of the people in that trial are people of color. So truly no company can be able to figure this out. So I decided to launch this company to address this gap. Talk about that process. How do you go from becoming a diplomat to co-founding and being a founder of a skincare line, which is totally complete opposites in terms of the career? Sure. One of the things that was really exciting for me as in my previous career as a diplomat was the opportunity to travel. And in that, I really had the opportunity to see all of these different places in the world and see different trends and different ideas that are moving extremely fast. Living in Asia at the time, and for those people who've been there, they know that the beauty industry is much bigger than what it is in the United States or in Europe, for example. And not only is it big, it cuts across gender. It's extremely common for men to use products. So being in that culture, seeing that, and understanding that we needed to have a product like this, it felt natural that the progression of the men's market in the U.S. would be something like that. For me, there were a couple personal moments that led me to creating the business. One being struggling with that problem, and understand that this was something that is not just a problem of esteem or a problem of believing that you should have clear skin, but something really around how do you help address this massive gap in personal care for people like us. Even though my previous career was one of public service, I still felt like there was another opportunity to really take a lot of learnings I had over my educational life, over my educational experience, as well as my my career experience, and bring that to bear in my work. So before being a diplomat, I, in graduate school, studied policy, I studied design, I studied a little bit of engineering, and a little bit of also some social policy. And so thinking about the different forces that impact our lives, design, policy, the way in which societies and cultures come together. One of the most prominent cultures that's fundamentally changing the way we think about ourselves and the way we live is that in beauty. So when thinking about pivoting from being a diplomat to this kind of company, for me, it was really an opportunity to marry a lot of the interests that I had, as well as projecting where the world was moving. One in which 
we are being more inclusive, being more thoughtful, being more attentive to our health outcomes, and being more responsible about the kind of things that would impact our lives. For me, directly experiencing skin issues, that was the most glaring and most, you know, most obvious problem. For other people, it might be something else, but I understood that even within that, if there's such a big gap for access, and not just for men or for you know guys who experience certain conditions, but really for anyone with pigmented skin, it's clear that this is something that needed to happen. And so for me, when I realized that, I knew I had to jump from what was previously a stable career into something a little more adventurous, if you can say. Patrick, I don't know if you want to get in depth. And so if you choose not to, feel free to, you know, say you don't want to chat about it. I wanted to find out when you were saying that you had had like an outbreak of your skin. Was it Mm -hmm. acne? Was it a rash? Was it, you know, can you be more graphic about specifically what it was? Definitely, definitely. When I was experiencing, I grew up with clear skin. Let me start with that. I grew up with great skin. I did not have severe acne growing up. I did not struggle with any skin problems. I didn't use any kind of products when I was growing up. You know, I had the facial wash that your mom would buy you, but I generally didn't experience any severe issues that people typically have during puberty. When I was working abroad, I started having breakouts. I started seeing acne all over my face, down the sides of my face. And what would happen is the acne, you know, you have a pimple, you pop it, or it would be popped on its own, or you're sweating excessively, and you're just breaking out all the time. And then the skin is trying to heal itself, you're getting dark spots, you're getting pigmentation issues, all these things. Here I was at age 26, 27, experiencing acne for really severe acne for what was the first time in my life. So for me, it was pretty significant. And then on top of that, not only would the acne, you know, once it, it once the acne goes away, you have the acne scars or your skin is dimpling and all these things that are happening. And for me, I had this moment of like, well, well, why is it like this? Why is my skin like this? I thought I had passed the time in my life when I would be experiencing severe skin problems. So for me, it was especially important to be able to try to fix that. I would do different things. I would, I had flown to Seoul. It was a four hour flight from where I was living. I had flown to Seoul to go buy tons of skincare products, hundreds of skincare products to, to fix them. I was in Tokyo, I would do the same thing. I one time went down to Hong Kong, right down the road on the train and bought products to try to help exfoliate the skin, try different things that, that none of them worked for me. And so struggling with that, it was like, if you're willing to go to these extremes to solve this, this is something that's really bad for you. So from, that's really what I was dealing with in my skin. Razor bumps and things like that, these are things that were always happening, but for me, it just all became apparent once it got so severe. That's when I knew you have to fix this. Wow. Patrick, I'm telling you, when I hear your story, I am sitting here like saying unbelievable because I'm looking at a picture of my son and his skin was flawless Mm -hmm. and he went to college and I don't know if it was the sports or what had happened and his just what you described was happening to his skin. Mm -hmm. And I was, I appeared to be, even though I wasn't seeing him as often, whenever I would see him, when I would fly into the games and he played soccer and his skin with the sweat, I didn't know if it was the sweat or what was um, going on. And my mom being older, she's 91 now. And she was saying um, he's contracted some type of disease or something. Um, using other people's towels. I mean, we were like all over the place trying to figure out what was going on with his skin. I was willing to spend, I didn't know how much money, it didn't matter. And then he started developing, I don't know what it is, in his scalp. It's hard. Dermatology is an exceptionally difficult field because of the way that it's 
been developed, it actually, much like any other medical field, a lot of the biases and a lot of the difficulties of treatment in different populations have been replicated, those inequalities. So when we're looking at a young man, it can be a young man of color, a young black man, and he's struggling with a lot of these different things that are happening to him, or even men in general, a lot of the studies that are funded are not towards the types of environments that a lot of guys find themselves in. They are meant to sell products predominantly to women. They're meant to sell makeup. They're meant to sell treatments and the types of types of things that are cosmetic. They're enhancements. They're not actual treatments. And so it's very hard to find the right solutions. And I think on top of that, when you're looking at diagnosis, just the fact that when we look at dermatology, we're thinking of everything from cosmeceuticals, which are your standard, you know, your facial washes, your product, like a lot of what we, we do, everything up to prescribed medications in between the OTC over-the-counter products that can be, you can just get it and it's still quite severe and it's quite strong. It's so difficult to really find what's right for people. And the fact that the science is not that well developed in terms of what can be effective or what does work makes it extremely hard and heartbreaking for a lot of people that are struggling with a lot of these issues. So ultimately, this is something that we saw as a big problem, which is, number one, this is just an incredibly difficult field because most of it is dominated in one particular area that doesn't actually center around treatment. Number two, access to those solutions and access to those treatments is actually lacking in a lot of ways. And then number three, the science behind what can be effective for people like us is so underdeveloped that essentially every time you're going to get treatment or try anything, it's like you're taking a risk or you're just hoping and praying that something will work without actually knowing what it can do. With a lot of the different impacts and factors that our specific skin, our specific hair, the way our bodies are, it's imperative that we work to develop that science to be able to create the best possible treatments that leads to even better diagnoses and more healing, better outcomes for everyone. How did you find the dermatologists or your team to work with you? And was it easy to get them to come on board to be a part of the company? I was really fortunate. I got a chance to work with Dr. McKinley Grant. She's Harvard Medical School grad. I uh, was been published by NIH, um, was previously at Duke University and is now at Howard University. So she happened to be my mom's dermatologist. So that was very lucky for me um, because I could have a direct connection. And when I came to her with the idea for the company, she was excited. And that was because no one had tried to do this. I think it's always about having these makeshift solutions in treatment. Partly it's hoping that what's out there on the mainstream can be effective for patients, but then also the idea that for someone like her who treats mostly patients of color, that there can be a company that wants to open the market up and really open up development to serve people like us and serve our community, that really resonated with her. And so we were fortunate to be able to have her come on as a board advisor, as well as help us with formulation to really adhere to best practices, both from her research and her practice in treating patients of color. So it's really exciting. And one of the things that you know we've, we've seen is the results of that work and that collaboration, which are people really enjoy the products and we have a really good basis on which to build the future of what this company can look like. How are sales going now? Sales are going really well. We've struggled in the past to keep products in stock. We are working really hard to accelerate our manufacturing, and that means we in the past manufactured in Thailand, and we still do, but recently brought on another factory here in America online. And so that's been a good development to allow us to meet the demand. We get a lot of repeat customers, which is really exciting. So I think what that shows is that we have a product that not only people use it and they find it to be useful, but they believe that it's something that they can continue to use on and on and on, which I think as a business that serves men is something that's important to establish, but also as proof that what we have is actually effective. 
And out of your product line, why don't you share, first of all, the product line and what is the number one seller? Sure. Our product line mainly consists of the Ceylon skincare set. The skincare set is a three-piece set that has a facial wash, a toner, and a moisturizer. We typically sell this set together. We do sell these products individually, but we sell this set together in a discounted bundle, mainly because we believe that this bundle is kind of the, you can say it's the essence of a skincare routine, wash, tone, moisturize, that you do in the morning, you do at night. We are also working on a handful of other products um, that will hopefully be released by the end of the year to do more treatments. So that's everything from targeting acne to dryness in the skin to kind of more extreme conditions. And so those are all things that we're really focused on. But for now, the vast majority of our, our customers are buying the skincare set because that's really where you find the value in the, and the efficacy in the product by having that routine because that wash tone moisturizer is essential to really giving yourself the opportunity to improve your skin. Patrick, tell us, and we'll also give this information at the end of the interview, but tell us where you're located. Is it a brick and mortar type business or is it virtual? And tell our audience about that. Sure. We are a direct consumer business and that is intentional. Direct consumer business means that you control the entire means of sales. So it's single channel. You can go to our website. Our website is saleonskincare.com. C-E-Y-L-O-N-S-K-I-N-C-A-R-E.com. From there, you can purchase the product. We ship it directly to you. So the reason we do that is because we know that often it becomes difficult for people to feel like they can communicate to the brand or talk to the brand or that the brand really has that ability to have a one-to-one relationship with everyone if we begin to disaggregate. And what I mean is, If you see us in a Target, if you see us in a Walmart, if you buy the product and you want to reach out, you want to ask somebody about the product, often you're having to rely on an associate. But by keeping it direct consumer, what we allow ourselves to do is really say, when you're buying it from us, you're also on our website, you're in our world, you're communicating us, you can be on our Instagram, and you can feel free to reach out to us, you can message us, you can talk to us. We're always available. And so that really allows us to maintain that line of communication. In the future, that may change, but for now, we we like that experience of doing the small things, seeing people come in, talking to them on the website, writing notes, really just keeping everything very aligned and very tight. Patrick, how long did it take you from the time of research and development to launch? It took about a year and a half maybe closer to two. I think the first part of that was really understanding the market and finding how the brand can stake a point of differentiation. One of the difficult things about launching a beauty brand is that there are so many out there. So what will be your point of differentiation? For us, one, our scientifically backed formulas that are specifically developed for skin color. Number two, For us, we want to make sure that we do enough research, enough development, and enough testing to ensure that what we are bringing to market is effective. So, for example, when we did our ingredient search and really looked at what could be effective, we had to test certain ingredients and really figure out, okay, does this, if we say that this formula is going to do X, Y, or Z, how do we know that? So, we did some testing with small groups of people, predominant people of color, got their feedback, did more prototyping, really worked with in our sort of mindset of A, number one above all else is to provide an effective product. So that's really what that time frame was. And then the rest of that time is everything from developing the brand itself, that means every all the visuals you see, to preparing your logistics. It's not easy to have a product made and have it ready to be shipped. And so a lot of that time is also just spent producing your product and really gearing up to enter the market. Because once you enter the market, you kind of get that one shot to do so. So tell us what is one valuable lesson you wish you knew before starting your business? I think one thing that often, especially in this world where 
people are told they can be the next Facebook, the next Google, the next Airbnb, the next big startup. You hear about startups in every category, it's typically tech, but often in beauty, often in, in skin, in personal care. You see them pop up and they have all this money and they're going extremely fast and they are just shooting up like a star. And what's happening and what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of these brands are taking all this money and they're put on this trajectory where it's either up or it's over. And I think that what a lot of people should know when they're starting out is you don't have to run as fast as possible. It's important to take your time. And once you launch, you'll still have time to figure things out, work out exactly how your business should pivot. But it's really important to take your time to get things right and to understand that your race is not the same race as the next company you see on Instagram, the next company you've heard of on New York Times, the 30 under 30 entrepreneur that you see on Forbes. Because often what you see is not what it actually, you know, is not the real story. A lot of people aspire to be these entrepreneurs doing these things and run as fast as possible, but they never tell you what the cost is to get there and what, what a lot of people have to give up and a lot of people have to do, both in terms of their personal lives or in their business, to become that thing that you see. Patrick, what did you have to give up? I think the number one thing that, I gave up was a sense of career security, mainly because I came from the government. When you work for the government, the federal government, that is, you have a trajectory. Do what needs to get done very well, and you can expect that your career should move in lockstep for about 40 years on average. If you start, if you come in at a relatively young age, in which I did, you have about 40 years, 40 to 45 years. And for me, that wasn't what I wanted out of my life. What I wanted was an opportunity to be a protagonist in my career. And that that doesn't mean just being able to select the next job, but really having to think hard about what problems, what things you want to work on. For me, When this came up, I knew that this was something that I really wanted to work on. And whether or not the company is successful by traditional means, you have to reevaluate what you believe success to be. For me, success is being able to serve our community, create a product that they care about, that they use, that they love. And then you figure out what comes after that. And so that uncertainty is uncomfortable for a lot of people. But for me, it was something that I was willing to endure and willing to bear for the opportunity to build something like this. What is your biggest achievement so far in your business, Patrick? I think the the biggest achievement has to be, honestly, acquiring customers. It's so easy to make something that nobody wants or that people buy and they never buy again. It's so easy to make something that people buy and don't care about. And I'll never forget the moment when someone sent an email. It was a few months ago and someone sent an email talking about how much the product had improved their skin and how they used to suffer from dark spots and razor bumps and they were using the product and their skin was clearing up like, it was incredible. And then the other part they said was, don't ever sell this company. We need this. And it was at that moment when I realized what you, you know, I, I, it's me talking to myself. It's what you've done is you, you really actually did create this thing that you set out to do. I use my product every day and people say, well, why do you need this? Like you have great skin. I'm telling them like, look, I have great skin because I use my own product not as an advertisement, but because this was what I needed. And I believe that this was something that our community needed because there are guys just like me who struggle the way I did and the way that I sometimes do. So when someone can actually give that energy back to you of being like, this is exactly what 
I need, this is exactly what we need. That was the moment, I think, when, when it really hit. What is the biggest challenge of being an entrepreneur? The biggest challenge, I think, is deciding what to do, what to do next. I don't mean what to do after you leave your business or what to do, you know, once you, if you sell or whatever it is. What I mean is the biggest challenge with your business is always the next step of what it's going to be in its life. When you have success in the business, opportunities come up. And one of the things that you have to get really good at is saying no to things that seem really attractive or are opportunities that you really might want to take. Whether that's people who want to fund and accelerate your business, people who want to partner with you. You know, the number of the number of well known celebrities that have reached out that want to do sponsorships or partnerships or collaborations. The number of venture firms that have reached out and, and want to put money to the company and turn to this, turn to that. And I think that one of the biggest challenges is deciding what is right for what is right for, for the company to make sure that it, that it lives up to its promise. Because often, I think a lot of the things that, the decisions that you can make going forward with the company can, it can feel exciting when you think about it, but it's very hard to assess whether or not it's the right thing to do. So that I think is, is definitely the most challenging, challenging thing. Patrick, talk to a younger you. What advice would you give to a younger Patrick? Advice to younger me. I think that, honestly, I think the advice I would give is stop being so stubborn. (laughs) But I think that your intuition is leading you into all these different directions and leading you to try all of these different things. And it's actually perfectly okay. You don't need to focus on one thing and just become that one thing. Because in the future, no one needs you to be just one thing. And so I think that's, that's advice to younger me. I think also advice I would give to any other young people is that you don't need to be a specialist. You don't need to be extremely skilled in one thing because the world doesn't work like that. The world truly is a place that requires that you've done many different things, that you've been through many different things, that you can bring a lot of different experiences to the table and can think in a lot of different ways. That's something that often gets lost in when you're growing up and the feeling is, well, if I'm good at this and I'm not good at this, at that, then I'm gonna focus on the thing I'm good at. Or, you know, I think that it's important to be able to just do enough of everything to be able to see and understand what it all is. Patrick, who are your top two influencers in your life and what lessons do they teach you? I think that my top two influencers in my life, I think that number one, I think, is a tie between all of, all of my dad and my uncles uh, in my family. That's maybe, maybe they're, they're the ones who influence me the most, I think, yeah, for the most part. And that's mainly because they all have had to work extremely hard in their life and, and really have gone in so many different directions, but have shown me that you can continue to just keep building and find new ways to evolve your life and your career. And that's something that often it's hard to see. I think we often think of people as having one, being one type of way. And for all of them, I think all of them have been able to, through their different enterprises, whether, you know, some are, some are doctors, some are engineers, some do policy, some doing real estate, but the idea that they're always moving forward, always building, and always continuing to create and evolve and try new things within the context of getting older, having family, having different ideas about what they want to do and what they want to be, but always evolving and moving forward. And I think that's something that, for me, I'm, I feel blessed to be able to see people who are my own flesh and blood to, to say, okay, you know, whatever you do today, it's not going to be what you do tomorrow. So long as you put everything into it, you're going to see the success from it. And when that's over, you'll move on to the next thing, be successful at that, move on to the next thing, and be successful at that, instead of kind of looking at everything like one straight line. And you talked about your influencers, your dad and your uncle, 
And let's talk about your your circle of influence. How did your dad and your uncle and those that are close to you, how did they take your journey in reference to leaving the government mm-hmm. job and going into business? Yeah, I'll say I'll say my mom is probably even closer in that circle. <laughs> She's definitely closer, um, I think, in the circle than than everyone else. But looking at my family and, and their reaction to it, it was all positive. I think that one of the challenges when you want to do something like this, especially when you come from a really prestigious career that has a great trajectory, is that you're giving up something really big and important for something that's incredibly uncertain. And overall, the reaction has been extremely positive. I think part of that is, again, this belief within our entire family is that, look, you are smart enough and capable enough and have enough resources to be able to make this work. If you can't make it work, you can do something else. And if it does work out, you might get tired of it and you can do something else. That's going to be okay. And we are willing to support you no matter what you do. So that's been really exciting, really helpful on that. You know, that makes it a bit easier, I think, from my perspective, because then I don't have to have this emotional pressure of, am I disappointing anyone? Am I failing anyone? It's my life. Everyone supports what we're doing. They see the vision. They like the products. Even though I told them that I was doing this at least two years before the company even launched, but... I think that overall, the reception and the encouragement has been really good. And so for me, that's been a really big point of of fortune, I think, for me. So I I don't think it can be the same for other people, but I will say on my side, it was definitely all words of encouragement. If someone wrote a book about you, Patrick, what would we learn about you that we don't know? I think in a book about me, everyone probably would learn that for the most part, this is not, this is, if we're looking backwards chronologically, this kind of business is actually exactly the kind of business that someone like me would have launched. Despite you know, being younger and never having struggled with skin issues, despite not really having any insight into the industry before having the problems that I did, I think for the most part, this is something that completely makes sense. I think that often when you see a company like this, especially one that's headed up by a guy that comes from a background that's quite different than beauty, it's very easy to say, well, this person is just, he is doing this because it's, you know, it's a small project or whatever. But I think looking back on my life and, and seeing the trajectory, it all completely makes sense. I have no clue what you know will happen in five years, for example, or in ten years, but every moment of it is really exciting and it's exciting to write a story. Tell us what you're most grateful for right now in your life. I'm definitely most grateful for my friends. Like my circle of friends, I think my circle of friends, chosen family, however you want to say it, I think I'm so blessed to have them around me because of the endless support emotionally, I think is, I mean, that's what keeps you going sometimes. Even if the business is doing well, I think the business, once you launch it, is just, it's standing alone. It's operating on its own. There are people working on it. There are things happening. And it's not about you. But in the low points of doing something like this, you have your friends there to help you and, and to really be with you and to spend time with them to help you think through things and go through things. And they themselves are going through a lot of things too, so it allows you to find your ability to step up and be there for them. And even though when you have a business, you can't always be available to them, or you can't always do some of the things that that you want to do, but I think for me, I'm, I'm most grateful for, for those people around me. And I've been incredibly fortunate to live in places where I and either with friends that I've brought from from other places or make new friends uh, along the way. Patrick, we can learn from successful entrepreneurs as yourself or brands. Tell us a brand or a business that is dominating 
and you admire that brand or business and why? Sure. I think if we keep it to beauty, I think that Glossier is quite a popular brand headed up by Emily Weiss is a really interesting company. I think that is a company that mirrors a lot of where we would like to go. I say that because one, the way in which they built their community around the ideas and the product, they had a community well before they had a product. And that's not the order that we did things. We're seeing, we're kind of doing it in reverse. But I really admire what Emily has done with that company because of the idea that it's something that brings a group of people, that's typically younger women, into skincare, into beauty, but also allows them for to have a place where they're engaged with it on a cultural level that encourages linkage with their peers, linkage with the brand, and linkage with people that are associated with the brand that they may not otherwise have a connection to, other than maybe also being young women. So I think that that's something that's really exciting and really interesting. I think for us, even though what we're doing is completely new and the world has never seen a company like ours, I think that there's a lot to learn in how you create culture and create community that spurs people to take actions that are going to strengthen those links and can be the platform for opportunity for greater growth, both as it comes, you know, both in, in a personal health way but also in a, in a psychological and mental health way. Really, the, the possibilities are endless. As people of color, as men of color, that has always been a very strong point on which we can grow and can develop, which is the building of the culture between us. What is a technology tool or technology platform that is a must-have for you in managing your business day-to-day? Right now, the biggest thing that we we use to manage. I would say the biggest platform, honestly, is email. That's the number one thing. I say email because email is our primary communication tool with our our customers, our community. We send emails, they send emails back, and we use that as a way to talk to people. Um, You know, we have shipping platforms, things like that, but I think email is really what's necessary because it allows for us to always have that open line of communication with the people that we want to serve. And if we didn't have that, if we didn't have a way to talk to people, I think it would be very, very difficult for us to be able to, to, to really do this the right way. If you conducted this interview, what is the one question that you would have asked yourself? And I want you to ask the question and answer it, Patrick. I think the one question that I would ask myself is what, you know, two, let's say it's, it's two years back. Two years back, we're still in the idea phase of things. What would I have done differently? And I think that what I, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. What would I have done differently today, two years ago? And I think for me, today, two years ago, I think I might have asked for a little bit more help ahead of time from people who have done. I have mentors that have been in startup world and that I worked for in their startup. And I think I would have made it more of a point to ask for help and advice before really digging in and starting to do a lot of the creative aspect of the company. And I think that's because now a lot of the things that I think I could have known or I could have kind of practiced or tried ahead of time it would have been good to, to have some insight into that and keep it top of mind while moving forward. I don't regret anything that has happened between then and now, but I think that being able to strengthen those, that strengthen and deepen that world of knowledge so that coming into this type of business, you are better armed to at least triage and diagnose things very quickly. I think that would have been, that would have been good. But even so, Everything you do, every mistake you make, everything you do well is a lesson. And sometimes you have to have a lesson that exists because you go through it. You, you won't learn it any other way. What are some healthy tips or strategies that you have adopted? Always try to get enough sleep. 
always drink enough water. And always, always, always carve out time to see your friends. That's probably the biggest thing I think that is important for me. You know, everything else I think exercise is great. And when you can do it, do it. I used to exercise a lot in the past, especially when I was just starting. Nowadays, I don't really get as much as, as much time to do so. Spending time with friends is huge, really important to me. I love doing that. Taking a break, literally like finding a way. It's hard now because we are growing very quickly. We are rapidly scaling. And so our organization, I, I don't get as much time to travel. I can't just leave for two weeks even if I wanted to. But I think that making sure that you can have some time away from what you're doing to really just clear your mind and allow it to fade a little bit before you come back to it is really helpful. We've come to the part of our interview, Patrick. It's called the Fun Facts Lightning Round. Are you ready for the Fun Facts Lightning Round and what that is? I'll ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to answer them very quickly. If sure. there's something you desire not to answer, feel free to say pass. Are you ready for the Fun Facts Lightning Round? Yeah. The last movie you saw? The last movie I saw was Bird Box, I think. <laughs> The Netflix movie. You relax doing what? Seeing friends. Your favorite singer or rapper? Right now, Michael Chiwanaka. Your favorite dance song? I don't have one. What food do you eat every week, no matter what? <laughs> Oatmeal. <laughs> Your favorite month? Gotta be, gotta be May. As I'm a May baby, so... Patrick, thank you so much for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast. Before we conclude, why don't you share with our audience again the best way for them to reach out to you and your company for them to support and do business and if they have questions about the product? Sure. So you can check out our website. Our website is C-E-Y-L-O-N-S-K-I-N-C-A-R-E dot com. That's CeylonSkincare.com. You can also go on Google, search Ceylon Skincare or Ceylon or Skincare Men of Color um, will come up. If you are hearing this, feel free to use a discount code on your first purchase, SUMMER15, all one word, all caps, S-U-M-M-E-R-1-5, no spaces. Uh, you can send us an email. You can email us team at A-N-I-M. L-A-B-S dot C-O. That's team at animlabs.co. You can email me directly, Patrick at animlabs.co. Send me an email, call me, text me, whatever it is. Um, be happy to chat. I have an open calendar. I have an open calendar for anybody who wants to reach out and chat that they can book time with me in 15 minute increments. I send it out to customers all the time, so I'm totally happy to speak as well. And yeah, uh, we're also on Instagram. Instagram and Ceylon Skincare. We're always on there. So there's lots of ways to reach out to us, Facebook. Uh, we have a Twitter. We don't check it quite as much, but we're definitely there. So all sorts of ways to get in touch. We're really excited about what we're doing. We're excited about the industry. We are very excited about the possibility of fundamentally changing beauty, dermatology, and the entire health industry overall through our work. And we expect to be able to continue growing. And uh, we're also hiring for people who are interested in working with us, who are interested in bringing great skin products. That's, you know, the entire range to, to our community. You can go to angel.co and search NM Labs, A-N-I-M-L-A-B-S. We're hiring there. And yeah, we'd love to work with you. If you are highly motivated and are interested in living and working in sunny Los Angeles, California, please reach out and we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Patrick. That's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening and subscribing to Black Entrepreneur Experience. We would love for you to leave a review and rating on iTunes and share with your friends. For show notes and more episodes, go to www.beepodcast.com. Join us next Wednesday and remember, green is the new black. So keep your bank accounts and your business in the black.